let us pray for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, we pray that you fall afresh on us this morning. We know that you already are alive within us. We know that you're already moving among us, but stir anew, stir afresh so that we can hear your word today, that we can understand it with our minds and believe it in the depths of our souls so that we can live as people who believe. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is the word made flesh. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to start at verse 16 and read through verse 19. Listen for the word of the Lord. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once knew Christ according to the flesh. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is our, um, we're coming towards the end of our series on racial justice. And last week, this week and next week, we're focusing a little bit on tangible things that we can do as individuals, as a community um, to work to create a more equitable and racially just community. Um, we've talked already about the theological foundations for that. We've talked about some of the history of racism and white supremacy in our country. And of course, now we have to move to what do we do about it? Um, last week, we talked about confession, about admitting our own role or the, um, for those of us who are white, the privileges and benefits we have received because of um, the oppression and repression of people of color, um, and for people of color to confess the ways we have believed lies about ourselves. And to, we talked about some public signs of confession, things like taking down monuments, changing the names of buildings, changing the names of sports teams, ways that we acknowledge in a public way um, our, the, role that, that, um, the role of white supremacy and, and we confess it. Today I wanna to talk about reconciliation um, and that's why I chose this passage from 2 Corinthians. And I want to start right there with the very first verse, because I think it brings up something that we sometimes hear when we talk about racial justice and equity. Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, or we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we want to do Christ according to the flesh. And when I read that this week in the context of thinking about racial justice, it echoed for me what I sometimes hear people say, I don't see color. Um, we regard no one according to the flesh. I don't see the color of people's skin. I'm colorblind. And if you've been paying attention to the, the conversations around racial justice recently, you might know, um, or if, if you've heard people say that to you as a person of color, you might know that, that claiming to be colorblind, claiming not to see color, not to regard people based on the color of their skin, is sometimes a cover. It's sometimes a cover for saying, I, I don't see the difference of experience that people of color have. And I certainly don't think that we're um, meant to judge people based on the color of their skin um, or, or treat them in a particular way based on the color of their skin. But we do have to see people's experience. We have to see the, the ways that um, color has affected people. Um, we have to appreciate the differences of culture and tradition. And colorblind, I mean, saying we are colorblind or we don't um, pay attention to the color of people's skin, it denies 
the vastly different experiences that people of color have in education, in employment, in criminal justice, even in interpersonal interactions. I don't think this verse ought to be used to say that we don't appreciate the experiences that people of color have. And so I think it's just important to make note of that as we start. And when it comes to the work of reconciliation, a big part of that work is appreciating the wholeness of, of other people and not to minimize or deny or erase their experience, um, the, the experiences they've had, particularly because of the color of their skin in this country. Um, at the same time, we don't wanna only regard people, of course, according to the color of their skin. We don't wanna put people in boxes based on the color of their skin. We don't wanna assume all people of color have had the same kinds of experiences. Of course they haven't, of course they haven't. And we should try to recognize the divine image in all people. And I think that's part of what Paul is saying when he says, we don't regard people according to their flesh because we once thought Christ, we regarded Christ according to the flesh. We thought Christ was a mere human. And we realized after the resurrection that he was divine, he's God. And so we too ought to recognize the divine image in each person that we encounter, not based on the color of their skin, but because they are created by God, loved by God. So we can, I think we can do both. We can honor and hear and tell the truth about the impact that racism and white supremacy and um, and the color of one's skin has had on one's experience. And we can see the divine image in all people. And those two things, being able to do both of those things are foundational to the work of reconciliation. Now in this passage, Paul is really mostly talking about not reconciliation between two people, but he's talking about reconciliation between human beings and God. The first and the, the primary act of reconciliation is initiated by God towards humankind. We don't initiate reconciliation when we confess our sins. God initiated the reconciliation. God reached out to us. God came to us in Jesus Christ, not counting our sins against us. Can we just say alleluia for that? that God came to us to be reconciled to us way before we ever thought to repent or confess, it's that God starts the process of reconciliation with us. Just now during our silent confession after the prayer of confession, I, I, you know, my niece is three and a half. It's probably a little early to talk to her much about sin. That's um, maybe not the, she's not the right age for that. But as she sat on my lap here silently, I whispered in her ear and I asked her to think about how much God loves her and how much her family, her mom and dad and her auntie and her oma and opa love her. And to just think about how good it feels to be loved like that, to be loved so much. And perhaps that's where we start with understanding the work of reconciliation that God does for us. To think for just a moment about how much God loves us, to come to us, not to count our sins against us, and to bring us, to, to come to us, to restore the relationship between us and God that is damaged by our sins, by our mistakes, by our failures. Think about how much God loves you. That's where the, the work of reconciliation starts with God's love, with God's reconciling love towards us. And then Paul says, we are given the ministry of reconciliation. We are called ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors of reconciliation. An ambassador has a lot of power. I'm looking just in my text. Um, I wish that uh, Emery Tsuole were still here. She works for the State Department. Um, and she knows something, I think, about how much power ambassadors have 
when the United States sends an ambassador to another country, to Bahrain or Brazil or Cameroon or Cambodia, that ambassador speaks with the full power and authority of the United States government. When they speak, it's as if the United States is speaking. And so here in 2 Corinthians, Paul is saying we are ambassadors of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are given a ministry to, to, to spread, to speak for Christ in the name of reconciliation. What power we have and how often do we use that power? How often do we, do we speak to the work of reconciliation? How often do we do the work of reconciliation? Part of this call is to tell others of God's reconciling work in Christ, to, to tell our three and a half year olds that God loves them so much to tell our neighbors who are hurting, um, our neighbors who are caught in addiction, our neighbors who um, are, are in any way um, lost, that, that they are loved and forgiven by God. And then the second piece of this, of course, is to be reconciled across our human differences, to be reconciled with those who are different from us, those for, from whom we are, our world tells us that we don't mix, we don't, we don't belong together, Last week, we talked about confession. Confession is where we name our, our part in the brokenness of our world. Well, reconciliation is the next step. Reconciliation is the work that it takes to come together again. We all know from our own experience that just confessing, just admitting you were wrong, just apologizing isn't enough, is it? There has to be the next step. You have to do the work to heal the relationship, to rebuild trust, to live in a way that's worthy of the relationship and that's worthy of the divine image in the other. I was thinking about this word reconciliation this week. Um, and I all thought, you know, it also has the meaning of um, checking something to make sure it's right. We reconcile our bank statements or our checkbooks or a receipt you take the one list and you compare it to the other and you make sure they match. And if they don't match, you have to go back and find the mistake and correct it. Because if you don't correct the mistake, things spiral out of control, right? If you don't reconcile your bank statement and you think you have $100, but you only have 30 and you keep spending money, then pretty soon you're in debt. And now you got fees and all of these problems on top of it. I think we could think that way about reconciliation and confession together, that we have to look at, at, at how things are supposed to be and how things are. And when they don't match, when the reality of our world doesn't match the vision God gives us for, for life together on earth, we have to say, where did we make a mistake and how do we correct it and make it right? That's another meaning of reconciliation. So I wanna invite you to think about your own experiences of reconciliation in your life. Um, you could think about maybe a if you have ever been estranged from someone and you came back together, or maybe even someone that there was no falling out, but simply a drifting apart. You ever drifted away from someone and then found your way back together? You might think of someone for, with whom you have a difference of opinion or understanding or perspective, and you manage to work it out, to find some common ground and to stay in relationship not to say I'm done with you, but to, to stay in relationship. Or you might be able to think about someone who has injured you, who has harmed you, and to whom you were able to be restored. Or maybe you think of a time when you have injured someone else. You have been the offender, and you were able to be reconciled to, to repent and be reconciled. Can you think about some experience of reconciliation in your own life, in your personal life? What does it take to be reconciled? In the case of God with us, God initiated the reconciliation. God came to be among us. Um, I think part of that is that God came to understand what our human experience is like by becoming human himself. We might call that in our human understanding, we might call that empathy. Seeking to understand the other on their own terms. 
empathy is is essential to the work of reconciliation. You can't reconcile to someone if you don't seek to understand them. I think that's why we have to regard people's experience. We have to let people share the experience of how the the how racism or white supremacy has impacted them. The other another key piece to reconciliation is listening. Listening to understand. We begin to be reconciled to those who we are um, separate from if we can listen to them and we can we can listen with empathy. And of course there's a repentance piece as well. We need to admit our part in the harm that was caused. So last week we talked about public acts of confession. Um, this week I want us to talk in a more personal way. You know, the work of racial justice and equity has to be both personal and public, um, individual and corporate, social. And it needs to be both. It can't just be one or the other. Um, the, the problem is too big to be just a, an individual problem. But it's also too personal to just be about laws and policies. Um, and so this week I want to invite you to think um, first to celebrate, to celebrate um, the ways that you have been enriched by sharing a relationship with someone who is from a different group or culture or background from you. Um, and Eric, I'll ask you to go ahead and put up the questions on the screen so that we can see them and begin to think about them a little bit as I finish um, speaking. Um, so one of the things as we think about reconciliation, reconciliation isn't just when we think about racial justice and reconciliation, it's not just for people of color. Um, it's not justice just for, for people of color, it's justice for all of us, that we are all enriched. The whole of our world is better. All of us can be better by embracing a more just and equitable and um, diverse experience in our, in our society. So the first question is I want you to think about a particular way that you have grown or been enriched by knowing someone who is a different race or ethnicity from you. What have you learned? How have you come to understand yourself better? How have you come to understand someone else or another culture? And if we can celebrate those stories of how our difference has enriched us, then perhaps we can move more easily into expanding our relationships outside of our race or ethnicity. And this is the second question. Could you commit today to reach out and connect with one person whom you already know who is a different race or ethnicity from you? And if so, who would that be? So here's the good news. We are a multicultural church. You already know lots of people who come from a different race or ethnic background from you. Um, you know, many people don't, aren't already set up to make these kinds of connections. And we do know one another at Elliott, but I think we can go deeper. Um, I think we can go deeper in our, our cross-cultural understandings our, um, of, of one another. We can listen more carefully to one another's stories. We can um, grow in our empathy for one another. So I want to challenge you this week to make a commitment to connect with someone you already know who is a different race or ethnicity from you. And just to be an to, to be willing to listen to them, to empathize with them, to understand more about what their life is like. You don't even have to talk about race. You don't have to talk about race, but find some commonalities, some things you could celebrate together. But the idea is to expand our relationships because when you are in a relationship with someone who is different from you, you can no longer stand by and watch when they suffer. You can no longer be silent when the laws of our land are stacked against them. So I think so much of social change starts with our personal relationships. And so I want to invite you to think about how you can seek racial reconciliation even in one relationship in the weeks to come. So these are our questions for discussion. How have you grown or been enriched by knowing someone who is different from you? And is there, could you commit to reach out and connect with one person that you already know who is 
of a different race or ethnicity from you? And if so, who? And I might challenge you in your groups to share that, to hold one another accountable, to take ownership of that challenge um, and, and to share that. So I'm gonna invite Eric to put us together into groups. Um, we can do maybe four people per group, Eric. And he'll try to make sure our groups represent our diversity as best he can. And you see the questions in front of you. So hopefully uh, you can have some good discussion. Let me see, it is, what time is it? It is 10.40, we'll go for about, uh, we'll go till 10.55 by the time we all get into our groups. So that's 15 minutes from now, 10.55, Eric. All right, we're doing pretty good on time, so why don't we do a quick report out. Um, if someone in your group shared uh, something they've learned from being in a cross-cultural or cross-racial uh, re relationship, I'd love to know some things that you guys have learned or how you've grown. You have to unmute yourself if you want to speak. Now, I know you've learned things from each other. Um, more than one of you are in uh, cross-cultural marriages, so I'm sure you've learned things. I have learned a great deal from my cross-cultural marriage. I've learned many lessons that I needed to learn of patience. Uh, there is a, a peaceful demeanor in the Asian cultures that uh, Confucius and Buddha may have generated at some point in time or had influence on that I have desired and sought after all my life. And I'm having an example of that in my own home and life these days. That's such a blessing to not be anxious, not to be constantly striving quickly. Um, Lessons of patience, listen, listening to each other. Wonderful, wonderful joy and blessings. Thank you, Charlie. Others want to share from your group, either your own experience or somebody else in your group? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, listening to what Charlie said, Hui expressed something similar he was working with a Korean pastor at um, Gordon Conwell, who was the dean of CUME. Um, and he said he was a Korean man and just never got ruffled. Again, mentioning that uh, for South Americans, you know, or and for those of us who grew up in Brazil, the reaction time to things is pretty quick. So having to work with somebody who just was very thoughtful and calm and pondered a lot and had that same even keel mm -hmm. demeanor really um, was was we really appreciated that something that I want to learn <laughs> <laughs> and for me it was more of a cross-cultural like as a teacher some I mean working with kids from all different kinds of backgrounds and kids particularly broken um, in seventh grade, it was really hard for me to hold my reactions. Um, and then working with Place of Promise and just seeing past the brokenness to the person and how you can love a person and not just react to their hurts. Um, it was helpful to me, you know, trying, you know, just seeing the humanity and loving, caring. Anyway. Thanks, Martha. Anybody else want to report out, Scott? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm just uh, very, very lucky to be part of Elliot. I, I was sharing my experience about how I, what I experienced when I was when invited by Martha Nuru twice and then Sue and her husband twice too, and. Uh, 
what I was actually looking for was how these people live their lives. And uh, I saw that there was a lot in common with my own ethnicity. Uh, the family values are almost the same. And the way they treat visitors is the same. And uh, the way they talk about family, uh, I realized that this society is not as individualistic as it is often said. I think family, family are always together. They may be apart, but they are always together. The, the, you know, the way they talk about family and the way they value family is very, very similar to, to my own background. And I really appreciate that. And that takes up to, it, it, it actually helped to demystify some of the stereotype that, oh, those people are people that are just living like individually, like we don't care about the other person. And so it's very amazing. And just love that they show to visitors is just the same. And in the, in the, in the context of my job, I, I've been working with people from different races, but it's hard to really know everything about them until you go see them where they live. And I had that advantage here at Elliot, and I appreciate that. Amen. Thank you, Scott. You bring out a good point, right? That the work of reconciliation can um, make us see the ways we're different and celebrate them and not try to change each other, but it can also make us see the ways we're actually quite the same. Um, and we don't have to Either, we don't have to erase the differences to be reconciled, but we also don't have to, but we don't want to buy into the stereotypes and we want to look for those things that are common. And I think that's that balance of um, recognizing that shared humanity, the divine image that's in all of us, but also recognizing unique experiences that we have because of our culture or our race or our experiences um, uh, that are affected by, by racism and white supremacy. Anybody else want to report out? Henry, are you raising your hand? I can't, we gotta unmute yourself. Hello? Yep, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I yeah, just have a little experience uh, had that I wish to share. When I, I left school, I worked in so many companies. I happened to have been, the last company that I worked for, I had uh, some uncomfortable situations where I, uh, although I was the first person hired to work for that employer, those who came after me were given some privileges, in, you know, uh, allocation of office spaces. My office never had a window. Those who came after me had you know, offices with windows. They could open the windows, nice chairs and all the like. So when I shared this experience with uh, one of my friends who was a senior staff, she had her own practice. She told me, Henry, why waste your time with that guy? Why not leave? Um, I told her, no, come to my office. I'm going to tell you how to open your own practice. I'm going to tell you some ways and, you know, how to go about. And she insisted, she persisted. She called for me. She invited me to her office, gave me the documentation, and, she, and actually made me start looking for a private practice. She did it. She put all her efforts, she called for me, she did everything. And I finally had a private practice of my own. And after that, I also set up other people. I have two other staff that have helped them to open their own private practices. One is talking to me even as of yesterday. So I, I just feel that sometimes, this was not a, a black lady, it's a white lady, it's an American. You know, much older than me, she was in her 70s. So, you know, what I learned from this, don't assume, don't say because this person is white, is going to do this, it's the bad person, or, you know, but the other people were treating me all white, but this is a white lady who had a different approach to life. She helped me. And uh, then, if I didn't listen, I just thought, oh, this is a white lady, what is she going to do? I would have even probably opened my own private practice. So I look at this as, do not assume, you know, a relationship with someone is very individualistic. You have to see the person, you have to experience before you make judgment about people. Don't judge. That's my way of looking at it. And in all, I still feel that when Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is still, although it's in the spirit, not flesh, it's an ambassador of reconciliation because it's always with us all the time and guiding us on how to do this reconciliation. So that's something I learned from. Thank you. 
Thank you, Henry. And I think that's a good note to end on that we, um, to remind us that we are given that Holy Spirit and we are called to be ambassadors for reconciliation, um, to use that, that high ranking position, uh, so to speak, and to, to do that work of reconciliation, to get to, to build relationships with people who are different from us, to celebrate both our differences and our commonalities. And, um, and when we do that work, we are doing the work of Christ. We are furthering the work that God has already done for us by being reconciled to others and to directing towards the reconciling work that God is doing. Um, so amen. Thank you all for sharing. It was really wonderful to hear those little snippets, the things we talked about in my group. I really appreciate it as well. Uh, I think we will, let me maybe close this section with prayer and then we will move along. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are the one who comes to reconcile us to you, that you come to live among us in the person of Jesus, to understand the fullness of our human experience, to forgive our sins, not to count them against us, so that we can live in right relationship with you. And Lord, we're humbled that you have trusted us, that you have um, called us your ambassadors for reconciliation on earth. Lord, it's a humbling call. We, we do not always live up to it, but we desire to. We desire to be so filled with your spirit that we can go out into the world and be reconciled to those whom um, our culture says we should be separate from, that we can be reconciled with those who have harmed us and with those whom we have injured, that we can be reconciled to those from whom we have no real difference, but whom, from whom we have drifted apart, that we can be reconciled across lines of race and class, politics, gender, sexuality. Lord, come with your Holy Spirit, continue to fill us, equip us, encourage us for the ministry of reconciliation that you have entrusted to us. We pray in the name of Jesus who accomplishes your reconciliation once and for all. Amen.